Hello and welcome along to Wired Foresight. I'm Greg Williams, Editor-in-Chief of Wired. Today's session is part of an ongoing series of conversations with leading figures and innovative thinkers in business, science, technology, academia and policy. To really investigate the changes that the coronavirus has brought upon us, to explore how the world will be shaped in the coming months and years, and most importantly, to understand how we can prepare for those changes. I'm thrilled to be joined today by Rana Faruha, Global Business Columnist and Associate Editor of the Financial Times and CNN's Global Economic Analyst. Her first book, Makers and Takers, about how Wall Street has come to dominate every facet of business life in the US, was shortlisted for the Financial Times and McKinsey Business Book of the Year in 2016. And her latest book, Don't Be Evil, examines how big tech, particularly Facebook, Amazon, Apple and Google, is having an outsized influence in shaping democracy, economies and people. Rana, welcome. Great to have you with us here today. Thanks, Greg. I'm so happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Rana, for joining us. Um, one of the arguments in your book is that big tech is monopolistic. Um, and I think that it, that's a really interesting observation at the time, clearly, when the global economy is tanking. Mm -hmm. Do you think the crisis has strengthened the competitive advantage that many of the large tech companies already have? Um, I'd have to say yes for at least some of them. Um, the most obvious example would be Amazon, right? I mean, you know, Amazon has become literally an essential company. Um, in the U.S., it's, it's hired 100,000 extra workers to um, deliver, to, to kind of meet the needs of quarantine. Um, you know, it's clearly uh, increasing its already massive market share, um, although not necessarily its profits. Um, and that, I think, is going to ultimately raise questions about the nature of this company. I mean, it, when you're essential, there's an upside and a downside, right? I mean, you know, you can get big and ultimately you can get monopolistic, but uh, you can also be thought of as a public utility. And I yeah. think that that's the question that regulators and the public really, I think, are starting to ask in their own minds about a company like Amazon. Um, you know, there, there are different cases for each company. I would say um, Google is uh, certainly, again, um, expanding, uh, Netflix is expanding, but how those companies will be thought of um, in a regulatory framework, I think, will be different. But I guess my, my baseline argument is right now there's this sense that, okay, before COVID-19, we were in the midst of this incredible tech clash and uh, these companies were going to be taken down and they were going to be front and center in the upcoming um, November presidential elections. The EC was, was targeting them. And that now suddenly amidst COVID, all that's gone in their Teflon. I don't think that that's actually true. And I would point to a number of ways in which politicians are actually beginning to look more carefully. And in fact, in, in some cases, even use uh, what's happened during quarantine as an example of why they should be regulated. And a case in point there would be the European Union looking at a company like, say, Facebook or, or YouTube and saying, well, you know what, you're actually doing a pretty good job policing some of this disinformation about COVID-19. Perhaps you could do a better job beyond the, the virus in the post-COVID world in different areas. And then that starts to edge into, well, are these companies um, like the digital town hall or are they actually media companies that need to be responsible for what users say and do online? So your view is then is that the regu uh, regulators will still have a, uh, you know, a, firm, a firm hand on thinking about how uh, large technology companies deploy this, this power that they have and influence they have. Um, do you think, what, why has it in the, do you think historically been so hard for government to create boundaries for technology companies? So I think a couple of things. Um, uh, there's a really wonderful book, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that Hal Varian uh, wrote called Information Rules. Hal is, um, of course, the chief economist at Google, and he wrote that book back in the 1990s. And it basically lays out the ways in which digital giants kind of upend the normal economic rules of gravity. Um, the network effect, um, it just creates a, a business model that's, um, you know, the, the big get bigger. It's just, it's sort of a natural superstar effect. 
and that can happen quite quickly. And as we know, regulation tends to lag. It tends to be based on kind of old business models, old paradigms. So that's point number one. Point number two, I would say, is opacity. Um, when, when you're interacting with the platform giants, you're doing a transaction, but it's a barter transaction, typically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're not necessarily making an, a, a really transparent transaction in which you're purchasing something in dollars or in whatever currency, and you're being given a product that you completely understand. That's Adam Smith 101. You know, in order for kind of cap yeah. capitalism to work, you need um, equal access to information. You need transparency on both sides of, a, of, a, of an interaction. You, he would have said you need a shared moral framework, which we can certainly argue whether that's in play at, at all when we're dealing with digital giants. Um, but in a barter transaction, all that stops working. And it's interesting because my first book was actually about the financial sector mm -hmm. and the ways in which um, the financial sector has become the tail that wags the dog of the real economy. And one of the advantages of the financial sector is there's a lot of opacity. There's a lot of po power asymmetry where big financial institutions hold a lot of information and they can see all of it and the person or the company on the other side can't can't see as much information that is um exponentially more true of a platform giant sure that, that, that makes sense um clearly amazon can now argue that it's an essential public service do you think that any of the other platforms can can, can represent themselves in that way i mean certainly lobbyists i'm sure would argue that facebook uh should be uh, considered in that way given the way that it disseminates news yeah it's interesting you know i i can see why a regulator might try and make that argument i, I actually don't think a breakup of facebook would necessarily get us to a better place uh, from a societal point of view and i really don't see facebook as essential i mean i i see facebook as a media company that is mining content for free largely um mm -hmm. from creators and not paying what it should be i think um for it, uh, you know, I, I don't think that if I think if Facebook went away tomorrow, um, the world would be okay. I think <laughs> if <laughs> I think if if Amazon or Google uh, stopped working, I think that that would be a bigger deal. Um, and it's interesting because you know we've already talked a little bit about Amazon and the way in which it's essential. But um, one of the points I made in my book, one of the most interesting things that I came across was going back and reading the original paper um, on search and search engines that Larry Page and Sergey Brin wrote in 1998 when they were at Stanford and starting Google and coming up with this whole concept. And that paper is really fascinating because they lay out, all right, what, what would a search engine do? How would it work? How would it be monetized? And they actually made the point that you might want to have ultimately a search engine in the public interest because if you use a targeted advertising model to monetize, then the interests of users and the interests of the advertisers, be they private or, or public entities, eventually will come into conflict. And so Google itself was way back when at its inception, making a pretty strong case that maybe you need a public search engine. Right, sure. I mean, just sticking, sticking to Facebook just for a moment, but I, I guess this also applies to Google company uh, YouTube. Uh, we're seeing here in the UK a lot of demonstrations by conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. around 5G, the anti-vax movement, and I'm, I know it's probably similar in the United States. Yeah. Um, why, can you just explain why Facebook is still, it's still so easily weaponized uh, by bad actors, especially, you know, we're, we're in a US general election year. Um, surely there's got to be more that can be done in order to prevent this kind of dissemination of, uh, of untruth. Well, you know, I, I would go back to the point I made earlier, and it's kind of all in that original 1998 paper that yes, when you have a targeted advertising model uh, and asymmetry in which there's, there's no transparency about who's advertising, how, I mean, even when these companies do create um, certain levels of transparency, it's, it's a very complicated process. I mean, there's tons and tons of detail to read through. Nobody's going to go online and, you know, say before they look at their Facebook page, oh, let me look and see exactly all the caveats about who's advertising 
and why and how they're trying to target me. No, that's not going to happen. I mean, how does it work in the real media world? And I would argue that these firms, particularly Facebook, really is a media company. I mean, it's just a big yeah. media company that has eaten everybody else's lunch and doesn't have to play by the same rules that Wired does or the Financial Times does um, or CNN does. Um, they don't have to take responsibility. And that is, you know, that goes back to the original, perhaps the original sin of, uh, of CDA 230 in the, U in the US, which is the yeah. loophole in the Communications Decency Act of 1996, um, which seemed quite appropriate then. It said, look, the, these, these firms, these startups at this point, startups in people's garages are the digital town squares. And of course, they shouldn't be held to the same um, standards that, uh, you know, a major publisher would be, but that's changed now. I mean, they are taking um, the vast majority of the entire advertising business. That's gonna be more true as we all know in the post COVID era. It's interesting, I think the virus has just time warped us to a place that we were probably going in two to five years anyway, maybe. Um, and now it's just, it's happening overnight. I think that's exactly right. I think it's just accelerated so many trends we were already seeing, you know, in every industry, whether that's retail or, or media. Um, just sticking with this point about Facebook and dissemination of information, um, Facebook, they made a lot of noise about their, their content oversight board, this, you know, the great and the good that they've assembled, various kind of uh, former political leaders and various other kind of uh, uh, important sort of figures, academics. Uh, do you think this is going to actually have any impact really in terms of the way that the platform works or is it essentially kind of ungovernable? Well, you know, there's, there's the Facebook answer to that question and then there's the broader answer. So let me give first the Facebook answer. I, I look at this company and I look at how many untruths they've already put out at how, how, um, um, disingenuous the leadership has been at any yeah. number of points in the last few years. And I, I gotta say, I just don't have a lot of trust personally in, in Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg. I, I just don't see that team as, you know, if I, if I'm, if I were covering this as a business story, I would say, I'm going to be very skeptical about anything that they say or do, but let me pull back the lens and say, even if the, they had were, you know, wonderful leaders and had done everything right, I would again, I would look at the financial sector in which you also have self self regulation, which I always see as an oxymoron because I just I just don't think it really works. Um, you have self regulation in that sector and you also have a lot of problems. You have, um, you know, continuing financial crises. You have continuing episodes of fraud. I mean, you know, um, a couple of years ago, there was the big scandal um, at the New York Fed uh, in which, in, you know, essentially fed workers that were being paid by the biggest banks that they were regulating were understandably captured by those banks you know so I, it's that whole model of oh let's just let the industry police themselves because oh this is a really complicated business and only they have the capacity to really do that i mean on what planet does that really make sense to anybody um yeah I think that we need to have strong, clear regulatory guidelines, um, democratically elected governments making the rules, and um, competent uh, bodies. Uh, and regulators, I think, can come from the industry. I mean, I'm not one that thinks that you can't work at Goldman Sachs and then be a regulator. I would point to someone like, um, again, I keep going back to the financial sector, but it's such a good analogy you get someone in the US like Gary Gensler, for example, who used to be um, a partner at Goldman Sachs and then ran the CFTC and was perfect for that job because he could understand exactly what bad business the banks were doing. I think that you could have um, uh, a system where you bring in experts from the industry into an independent board, um, algorithmic auditing could be done. You could imagine that, and then there could be limits on how you can go in and out of industry or you know, whether you could work at business after that. Uh, but, but you've got to have independent regulation. It just self-regulation is a myth. It never works.
Just touching on retail now, um, I know you've talked about Amazon a little bit already, but I'd love to kind of get your thoughts further on it. Um, obviously, there's been kind of you know rel relatively positive uh, earnings reports from all the, the large technology companies in the last quarter. Amazon announced a $4 billion profit, which uh, Jeff Bezos says it was going to reinvest back into the company. And it seems to me they're trying to create this kind of, you know, um, uh, almost kind of COVID free supply chain so that we, we, we know exactly that uh, we can trust Amazon in order to uh, deliver whatever it is we might need. Do you think that retail is now almost becoming as like, almost like a zero sum game? Like it's, it's, it's Amazon almost versus everyone else. I, I think so. And I think, you know, that goes back to those, that original Hal Varian um, book yeah. uh, on, on, on how the, the intangible economy works. It really does sort for superstars, you know, that, that the whole nature of the network effect of the digital economy of the asymmetry of transactions and information, it, it's, it allows the big to get bigger. So yeah, I do think that there's, there's a risk of that. Um, and I think that that's ultimately why these companies probably will be either nationalized in the case of Amazon, broken apart. I think you can even see them starting to, to think that way. I mean, before COVID is, is different and I think it is perhaps um, given more leeway um, for, their, for their existing business model at the moment. But pre-virus, the company was starting to even brand different parts in different ways. Web services is over here, retail is over there. Um, they were starting to, you know, do a lot more with targeted advertising models. So kind of intersecting with Google's business. So um, I think it's quite possible that after the virus, um, after we're out from, from this period of emergency, that you could see regulators begin to take a hard look. Um, Maybe breaking AWS off I, or, I, I mean, because Amazon's so. what? Amazon's now, now rifling Google in terms of search, I think. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I think you could imagine a breakup. You could imagine nationalization, which frankly will play into the politics of the moment, um, you know, both in Europe and in the US. I think that we're moving, I, this is a kind of a broader conversation, but it's important when we think about the future of the tech companies. We've had 40 years. I mean, if you kind of go from the Reagan-Thatcher revolution of the 1980s, we've had 40 years of loose regulation, easy monetary policy, wealth creation at the top, the big getting bigger, um, superstars growing in all industries, and then technology and digital transformation and the shift from a tangible economy to an intangible economy, putting all that on steroids. And pendulums always swing, right? I mean, you know, power moves from the private sector to the public sector and back again. That's why we got the Reagan-Thatcher revolution. You could argue that if you went back to the 70s that the, you know, the public sector maybe had too much power. I think that we're now shifting on both sides of the Atlantic um, back towards more public sector power and wealth distribution um, to, a, to a broader number of, of entities. Yeah, I, I was going to sort of ask you about that. You know, we, we, you know, we've created this economy, particularly uh, the, the gig economy. And I think one of the things that we've, we've discovered in the last sort of six, eight, nine weeks is that many people and i'm not just talking about people who are working in the gig economy but many people who would consider themselves middle class are really operating at very very thin margins and it's it's been fascinating to see that we've created a, a pretty an economic model that has very very little resilience and we, we and it's quite brittle in, in many instances yeah no 100 percent. i mean that that kind of trade-off between efficiency and resilience is front and center now and actually, that's going to intersect, I think, with the tech story in the sense that, um, you know, countries are going to move supply chains back. You're already seeing a company like Apple, for example, being really affected by that. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I think that, that that trend is going to speed up. Unfortunately, particularly in the U.S., you now see some of the largest companies, Amazon is case in point, but also Google and, and Facebook, um, using that moment to say, hey, don't break us up, don't regulate us, don't don't apply existing competitiveness standards to us because we are your national champions in this battle with China. And of course, China has its own digital giants. Um, I think that that's worrisome because I think if you look at where innovation comes from, it tends to come from um, individual academics, from small and mid-sized businesses. Typically, once a firm goes public, it's, it becomes kind of an implementer of technology rather than an innovator 
Um, and that's, you know, that's down to the shareholder value model, the Chicago School thinking, all of which emphasizes efficiency over resiliency. So you've got all of these different interesting vectors colliding now where I think countries are going to be thinking a lot more about how do you create more resilient economies? Um, you can imagine kind of a light path and a dark path there. The dark path would be a lot of nationalism, a lot of protectionism. We go back to the 1930s, we have some sort of terrible tech trade wars that become very Hobbesian, zero sum. But you could also imagine if, if we can find some middle ground, and, and I, I would love on that score, I would love, love, love to see a real rich conversation starting a transatlantic conversation about how to create new rules of the road for trade in the digital economy right because i mean so many of our trade battles are about steel and bananas and it's just you know i mean the only thing that's been growing in the last 10 years is digital trade and yet we still don't have um a sort of you know fair um global rules of the road there so having that conversation and using that as a moment um to to make sure that all right, maybe we need a bit more localism in some areas. Maybe we need uh, more, more um, uh, you know, duplication in supply chains, but let's not make this a go it alone, each country on their own economy. I think that could be a, a positive outcome. Just following up from your, your, your point about sort of supply side economics and the Friedman model. And the, I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing also at the moment though, is the fact that clearly, we're going to get some really big winners now. Um, you know, I was thinking about Uber's purchase of Grubhub in the United States. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're also as well? And I, I agree with your broader point. I think you're absolutely spot on in terms of this movement away uh, to kind of create more resilient economies and, and, and less fragility. But are we also seeing sort of some degree of consolidation in some industries? So uh, that sort of, you know, on demand economy, if you like, there are going to be clear winners in, in this probably in the next sort of two or three months, we're going to see larger companies formed uh, as they, you know, as, as they eat others that maybe have failed or are in distress. Uh, I think that that will happen. I mean, there's no question, you know, look, even before COVID you had about 80% of all corporate wealth was hubbed in 10% of companies. And those were the companies that had the most data and the most IP. And hmm. I think that that's probably going to shift to more of a 90 a 90% and 5% or even a 90% and 2 or 3% kind of model. But again, the big question is going to be how, how does that level of corporate concentration and wealth concentration work? How does the math work, particularly amidst the virus? I mean, you know, we have entire countries within countries now of unemployed people. I mean, in the US, there are vastly more unemployed people than there are in the entire country of Australia. You know, it's like, it's unthinkable yeah. that, that this is a sustainable model. I mean, inequality was unsustainable before the virus. After the virus, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, you can't imagine that there isn't going to be some kind of discussion about a redistribution of wealth. And you know, something we haven't talked about yet, which I suspect will be coming, uh, is some kind of a digital dividend tax. Um, I mean, this has already come, come in, many, in many countries, but I think that um, getting the wealthiest entities and the wealthiest individuals to pay more of a share for retooling and providing a safety net at this moment is, I, I just don't see a way around it. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. It seems to me that, you know, we have, you know, some of the richest people in the world, some of the richest companies in the world. In fact, you know, whatever, there's five or six richer companies in the world um, are Silicon Valley companies. Um, there is a big question about the amount of, of corporate tax that's being paid, certainly here in the UK. I know in the US, I think Amazon got a check from the government last year. Um, it really is just something that presumably cannot continue in the current environment when we're looking at governments taking on huge amounts of debt in order to try and sustain economies. It's a, it's a very interesting moment um, right now. One would think, and I would have said uh, before the virus, you know, we're absolutely heading in the US, for example, post-November to um, a democratic administration in which you start to get a shift away from trickle-down economics higher taxes. Um, I think we're probably still going there, but one of the interesting thing that's, things that's happening is you're also seeing a last 
gasp of, oh, let's just toss the ball to the Federal Reserve and let's let them, um, you know, keep interest rates low, throw a lot of money at the economy, and we can kind of keep the old model going. This is happening in Europe too, of course, and you're seeing Germany, you know, always concerned about the return of the Weimar Republic, say, actually, no, you can't do that. We're going to have a different model. Now, uh, that's, that's a different story, but there is this fight now between can we keep the old model, can central bankers just kind of keep papering over the problems of inequality and of corporate concentration, um, or do we really have to shift to something new? And I, I'm a bit worried that that's going to get worse before it gets better and that we're going to see some quite ugly politics around all this. And I think what's happening in Europe is, is case in point. And another area where we might see uh, further maybe encroachment on, on, on uh, uh, the, the rights of citizens is the fact that a lot of people are going to say, OK, you know, I was concerned about privacy. I was concerned about surveillance, but I'm really willing to have some kind of product in my pocket uh, yeah. that is run by a private entity uh, that, you know, records my, you know, my, my, my movements and my, uh, my activity. Do you think that increasingly the public are going to be willing to accept this kind of mass surveillance model by private companies in the interest of, of public health? Again, very, very interesting tipping point, because on the one hand, people are desperate to go out, right? They're desperate for their lives and for the economy to return to some semblance of normal. And so there's there's a sense that, well, maybe I'll do whatever that takes. But then when you look at the surveys in both the UK and the US, only about half, sometimes even under half of the population say, yeah, I'd be willing to share my health data on an ongoing basis of the public. Or yes, I'd be willing to tell you which flights I'm taking and where I'm going. Once you start to dig into it, um, people really, really don't want to be tracked in that way. And so I do think that there need to be firm rules and there are um, you know, bits of legislation being crafted right now on both sides of the Atlantic to say, all right, if there is data collection that has to happen for public health reasons during this uh, crisis moment, that cannot be used later on. That uh, there have to be kind of strong boundaries put into place about what these firms do. I, I, I do worry that it's gonna be very difficult to enforce that. I mean, if you just look back so many times in history in the last decade, you know, Google saying, no, we won't combine um, search information with location information, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. all these promises. <laughs> and then they're, they're difficult to police, they're broken. So kind of, you know, why do we think it's gonna be different this time? Um, but I guess one of the things I'm hoping can happen and, and maybe conversations like this can help it happen is we often talk about privacy in kind of one basket and competitiveness issues in another basket, I actually think that they're really, really interlinked. And there's this big existential debate right now about um, how, how do we grow in a sustainable way? How do we create um, human-centered innovation? And there's an argument that, well, really, we've kind of entered this age of AI in which it's all about ring fencing the most data, and China's going to have a huge advantage. You have no privacy concerns. You can have all this data, and the big giant companies can go off and create the next generation of innovation with that. That's one argument, but I would look back at the history of innovation and say it tends to be decentralized. It tends mm -hmm. to come from, from smaller entities, and so maybe that's a competitive advantage within, particularly for liberal democracies that, that want to protect their values and grow their economies at the same time. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that. I mean, I was uh, part of a conversation this morning uh, with a, C a group of CEOs and they were saying that they had, uh, the, the, their teams, they were being very productive uh, working from home, but also interestingly that they had um, managed to move their businesses forward in digital transformation or however you want to put it in terms of like producing new products new services they had sort of done about you know a year's work in the last sort of month or so in terms of moving things forward so i think probably this is a period we're going to look back on and say there was a lot of innovation because frankly people had to innovate they had to think that rethink about their businesses and what their offering was and how right. they were going to connect with consumers I, I completely think that's right. I mean, we're in a real period of creative destruction right now and innovation. So uh, final question, Rana, we're pretty much out of time, but I'd just love to get your sense of, you know, thinking about the big themes of the book, 
uh, uh, in terms of individual uh, power, the hold that uh, the large tech companies have over individuals, over our democracy, over our economies, the, the big three themes in the book. How do you think this is going to play out over the next, if you could look forward a year or two, are we going to see this regulation that we've been pro we were promised over the last couple of years, or is that going to slow down? I think we are going to see more public oversight. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to end on a hopeful note, and I actually feel more. It's funny. I if you if we'd had this conversation pre-COVID, interestingly, I think I would have been a bit more pessimistic. Um, but you know, sometimes crisis is opportunity, and I think on both sides of the Atlantic, there there's now just a there's such an understanding that we need a new paradigm. Um, we we cannot move to a zero sum world. That's just such a such a dark place. And so I'm hopeful that a younger generation, particularly on, you know, on both sides of the Atlantic, will start a conversation um, in which we can start to think about how do we craft a new model for digital trade? How do we bring in ideas about sustainability? Um, what are the new institutions, um, you know, post WTO, post IMF, you know, maybe some of these institutions still have a place, but if they can't evolve and grow, maybe new institutions will, will take their place. I do think there's a younger group of millennial citizens um, in both Europe and the US that have similar values. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that, that they'll come together and that could be the basis of, um, you know, moving us to a better place with all this. Ron, well, I'm so happy we could finish on, a, on an optimistic note. <laughs> Me uh, too. I, I have to recommend to everyone they should read your book, which I, I thought was absolutely fascinating. And uh, every week I never miss your column in the Financial Times. So uh, oh, thank, thank you so much you. for spending some time with us and uh, look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to everyone watching the session. If you enjoyed today, please do take a look at the rest of our Foresight series. Uh, we have multiple sessions, including those with economist Richard Davis on finance in extreme situations, the academic and writer Rachel Botsman on trust, Helen Tupper and Sarah Ellis on the new world of work, and Harvard professor Rebecca Henderson on how the current crisis is an opportunity for the business to forge a sustainable future. You can watch them all at wired.co.uk. In the meantime, thank you, stay well, we'll see you soon. <laughs>